I shared in a sermon recently that over the course of my a little over 30-year ministry, I have done somewhere in the neighborhood, like many preachers have, of about 600 funerals. I have never seen one person get up and leave. I, I, you know what I mean? I've, I've never seen one of them come back. As far as I know, all 600 of those bodies are still in the ground somewhere. But I remember going and visiting with Jackie Jerusalem and going to a place where it's historically or traditionally believed that Jesus was one who was buried. And we went in that tomb, and would you believe he was not there? It feels to me like there is a renewed sense of excitement or enthusiasm or focus in many churches today on celebrating the resurrected Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Easter has become in our culture a holiday. You all know what that means. Uh, number one, it's a day off of work for those who work on the weekends, and it also means it's a holiday where special events and special activities, and my goodness, don't we all look good today? Um, it, it's just become another holiday. But I want to remind you that holiday comes, it's a, it's a conglomeration of words which means holy day. It is a holy day because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And, and I just believe that many people know the what, but do they really remember the why? Why is the tomb empty? So if you're turning your Bibles this morning, John chapter 19, I want to take you real quick through a snapshot of why it's important. Because I want you and I to be able to firmly believe that, listen, I have good news for you. No matter where you came from, no matter what you're going through, no matter where you're headed, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that means for you, victory is possible. Victory over the sin and the stuff of life. Victory over the fear and the darkness of the grave. Victory over the torment of an eternal hell. Victory that you and I can enjoy now here on earth and for eternity. You and I can celebrate and know that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I mean, after all, is Easter just a time to get up early and see a sunrise? Is Easter just a time to get dressed up? and wear something nice and new? Is Easter just a time to gather with your family and maybe go to church with grandma and time to celebrate some traditions or some heritage? Is Easter just a time to, to decorate your yard or your house with eggs and bunnies and beautiful colors? It may be all that, and in fact, I think all that's okay, but let's remember why Jesus is risen from the dead so that you and I can have victory in our lives right now and victory for all of eternity. You know, many have heard the biblical account and I'll share it with you today, but I want you to remember the why. Why did Jesus get up and leave that tomb? Because he loved you, every single one of you. Every, me, us, he loved us enough to pay the penalty for our sin and prove it by leaving the tomb. So if you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me. Hear the reading of God's Word, John chapter 19. I will tell you it's a long passage. So if you're not able to stand, that's okay. You be seated and read along with us, all right? In John chapter 19, I'm going to begin in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that already all things have been accomplished to fulfill the Scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. And a jar of sour wine was standing there, and they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first man, of the other one who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen and testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may also believe. For these things have come to pass to fulfill the Scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, the Scripture says, they shall look on him who they pierced. Now, after these things, 
Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had come to him first by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone had already been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple who Jesus loved and said to him, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they played him, where they've, where they've laid him. And so Peter and the other disciple went forth, and as they were going to the tomb, the two were running together. The other disciple ran ahead of Peter, ran faster than Peter, came to the tomb first, and stooping down, looking in, he saw that linen, the linen wrappings were lying there, but he didn't go in. And so Simon, Peter also came, and following, he entered the tomb, and when he saw the linen wrappings lying there, the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who came first to the tomb, then he also entered, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And so the disciples went away again to their own homes. Mary was standing outside the tomb and weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb and saw two angels and white sitting and one of them at the head and one of them at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she heard this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to him, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where they've laid him and I'll, I'll, I'll take him away. Jesus said simply to her, Mary. And she turned and she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me for I've not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, announced it to the disciples. I love what she said. I have seen the Lord and that he said these things are to be. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather with so many today and celebrate your power. It is your power that raised your son from the dead. It is your power to give us life. It is your love compelling you to send your son, our Savior, to love us with a love we can't even understand. And Lord, I thank you that we can come here today. We can celebrate. No matter, what the, no matter how it may look or sound, Father, we today, we celebrate that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Would you help us to go to our brethren and tell them? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You could be seated. You know, I, I'm just painfully aware that, again, I'm afraid that many of us, we have forgotten the significance of what it took to have the tomb be empty. And so I want to I just take a minute and remind you of the three major events that are part of this experience for us. The first is how you and I going to fully celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First thing you have to recognize, you and I have to admit that there's simply been a death. We have to acknowledge and recognize that a death has taken place. In verses 28, 29, and 30, you and I simply recognize that there's an interesting and there's a the definitive statement here. Because the first thing you and I recognize that Jesus hanging on the cross, the two statements that he made that were of significance are, first of all, it is accomplished, it is finished. Those two phrases are important for us because the people who looked on, what did they see? 
They saw a preacher from Galilee uh, who did miraculous miracles, who taught with great wisdom, who had something about him that set him aside from everyone else. And he predicted that, it, that, that the temple would be torn down and he himself would build it back in three days. And they didn't recognize he wasn't talking about the church. He wasn't talking about the temple. He wasn't talking about that great massive structure that they went and worshiped God at. He was talking about the temple of, of the body and that he would raise, God would raise him from the dead in three days. And Jesus says, hanging on that cross, it is accomplished. What is accomplished? What is accomplished is the sacrifice for sin. He was willing to become the sacrifice for all sin. Now, if you've hung around a church very long, you know that, that, that the Hebrews practiced the, a sacrificial system where they would simply take that which was innocent, pure, and sacrifice it so that the blood of that pure offering would cover the sin of, of, of the people. And Jesus now applies that to a person. Now, it's easy enough to say, oh, nobody's perfect. I, I mean, that's easy to say. Y'all agree with that? Nobody's perfect. Well, gang, I'm afraid that nobody's perfect really doesn't get to the heart of the matter. It's not just that nobody's perfect. It is that everyone is a sinner. And let me tell you what the Bible says about sin. God pours out his wrath on sin. Have you ever, um, maybe your children or your grandchildren, have they done something they weren't supposed to do? They, you said, don't do that. And they did it anyway. Am I the only one? What did you think before you first began to focus on the person and what they were going to be in store for? What was the first, in, what's the first emotion that you probably had? Well, it depends on how many times they did it. I told you once not to do that. I have told you before not to do that. Am I getting warm? I told you not to do that. And what is the emotion that you're hearing? Is it anger? Is it wrath? Well, I want you to know something. There's a distinction between biblical anger and biblical wrath. We're all quick to say even Jesus got angry, right? Y'all not. Even Jesus got angry. Listen, the Bible doesn't say that God got angry. The Bible says he has poured out his wrath. Y'all know what wrath is? Wrath is un, it, it, it is, a, it is all in, it is total and complete anger. Now, I want, I want, let me be very clear. God's not angry at you. You know what God's angry at? He's angry at sin. And because you and I have a sinful nature, he's angry. And, and I don't know how to, I, listen, I'm, I'm just a simple boy from the middle village, so I can only tell you what I can tell you. I believe that what God hates is the sin in me. See, he loves me. But he hates the sin in me, and something's going to have to die to pay the price for it. And Jesus says, it is accomplished. He has died to pay the penalty for my sin. He said, it's accomplished. In verse 30, he says, it is, a, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Friends, I'm, I'm telling you all this because I, I want to be clear. In order, for, in order for us to celebrate the resurrection, we have to recognize there must be a death. Death is brutal. Death is final. And Jesus, hanging on the cross, said, it is finished. It is accomplished. I have done the work that God sent me forth to do. I am now the willing to take the sacrifice of all of humanity's sin on myself. He felt it so deeply, so strongly that in the garden, when he prayed and agonized over it, he was like blood. He was like sweating blood. The agony was so great. When he hung on the cross and he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? You know why he said that? Because he felt the condemnation of every sin ever committed. And he felt it all. And he says, confidently, it's accomplished. It's finished. And then he died. It is, it is a finality of life. You know, I do want you to remember something. 
that after proclaiming the work is complete, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I want you to know clearly, Jesus was not murdered on the cross. Jesus did not have his life taken from him. He says in John chapter 10 that he gave his life. Listen to what he says. I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's, a, he's, a, he's, not, he's, a, he's not a he's a hired hand. He's not a shepherd who is the, who's not the owner of the sheep, who sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he's a hired hand, doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own and am known by them. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not this fold. I must bring them back also, and they'll listen to my voice, and they'll become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that this, I love this. He says, I lay down my life so that I can take it back up. There's a hint right there, gang. That's a clue. Jesus is already telling us that he's going to be resurrected. No one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down of my own. And listen to what he says, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back up, the commandment I have received from my Father. Jesus was willing to die, and nobody chose that but Jesus. He chose to die for us. You know, in in my own life, in my own experience, when I served as a police officer, Uh, for just short of 10 years, I saw a lot of death and I saw the brutality of it. I saw the agony and the, the, the bluntness of death. As a preacher, I just told you a few minutes ago, I've dealt a lot with the finality of death. I've had to stand by a lot of caskets and a lot of gravesides. I've had to comfort a lot of grieving families because I've seen the finality of death. I want you to know something. As a sinner, I've seen, this, I've seen the result of sin. I have felt the guilt. I have felt the condemnation. I have felt the result of a death. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have the victory over death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ who has risen from the dead. So somebody has to die. I'm glad it's not me. I'm glad it's not you. Even though we will someday die, our bodies will stop to function unless Jesus comes. Hey, would you agree with me? Wouldn't you rather him just come get us all at once? Wouldn't you all like that a whole lot better? I sure would. But death is very final. Jesus he didn't just pass out. He didn't swoon. He didn't go into a, he didn't go into a coma. I know. So Jesus, quite honestly, died. You have to recognize there's a death. And what happens after somebody dies? All right, somebody tell me. What do you do when somebody dies? You bury them. And so you have to recognize, you have to accept the reality of a burial. Verses, uh, chapter 19, verses 38 um, through 42 reveal the events surrounding the death of Jesus after he's died. Now, I'm going to go through this real fast. Are y'all okay? Everybody look at y'all okay? All right, let's just go real fast because, again, how many times have you heard this? My hunch is, odds are y'all have heard this before, okay? So, we're going to go through this real fast. First of all, Jesus, uh, John speaks of the men who came to the tomb and handled the burial. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for permission to take the body. Now, what we know is Joseph of Arimathea, the Scripture clearly tells us he's a follower of Jesus or he believed in Jesus. He had recognized or he acknowledged, yes, Lord Jesus, I I accept who you are. But notice what it says. It says that he did it quietly and secretly. He was a a secret agent almost, a, a secret Christian. And Matthew describes Joseph as a rich man. Mark describes him as an honorable man. Luke also refers to Joseph as a counselor who was good and just. And so, apparently, Joseph was a very intelligent, well-respected, well-known guy, but he was a secret follower of Jesus Christ. 
along with Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea is just a reference to the town he's from. Accompanying him is Nicodemus. Now, you all, y'all have heard this before. Y'all know who Nicodemus is. Nicodemus is over in John chapter 3. He is a Pharisee who was, he, something captivated him about Jesus. And so he said, I, I want to find out what he's talking about. And so he went to him at night. So nobody would see him as a Pharisee going and talking to this rebel-considered um, preacher from Galilee. And that is the conversation when Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said that to Nicodemus. He was, that's who he was talking to. And so Nicodemus is a secret follower. You all see the obvious connection here? These two secret followers of Jesus. It's interesting to note that the difference the death of Jesus made in these two guys. Because first of all, they're secret followers. Now he's going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus. Jesus' death, watching Jesus die has somehow had an effect on them, and it has changed their perspective. The Scripture goes on to tell us that Nicodemus comes, and he, the passage actually says he brings the spices weighing about 100 pounds. Listen, I've been trying to watch my weight, and you know what I was told? I was told I need to drink a gallon of water a day. Good thing I don't do it on Sunday morning. A gallon. Do you all know how much a gallon of water weighs? Eight pounds. That's how much it weighs. He brought 100 pounds of spices. Most, uh, most Jewish people in Jesus' day, if they, could script, if they could scrape together just enough spice to keep the smell down, they were satisfied. I'm sorry to be blunt with you, but that's the truth. He brought 100 pounds. That's like a great big old sack of seed that he brought to anoint the body of Jesus. He brings that to prepare the body. It's the customary uh, for the Jews. And it's also interesting, notice that it's a tomb that had not been used before. Now, why did John add that little detail in there? A tomb that had never been used before. Get ready. You know what that means? Sometimes they reused the tombs. Sometimes people would die and if it was a cave or, or something like that, they, they might place the body there, and they might come along, and somebody else might pass away, and they just put them in there. And so you might have multiple people or even multiple families buried in a tomb. This is a tomb that hadn't been used yet. And so they come, they slink out of the darkness into the light, they spare no expense in preparing the body, and they place it in the tomb. Isaiah 53, 9 says, And his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Listen, do you know where the largest cemetery in the world is? Let me back up. You know where the largest cemetery in the United States is? The largest cemetery in the United States is located in Queens, New York. Um, And it has about 3 million graves in that cemetery. The largest cemetery in the world is located in Iraq. It's the Wadi El Salam Cemetery in Iraq, and it has 6 million graves in it, or estimated about 6 million. They don't keep the records kind of the way they do up in Queens, New York. The largest cemetery in the world. You want to guess how many of those have had somebody get up and leave from? Only one. It is the garden tomb just outside the edge of the city of Jerusalem. See, in order for the resurrection to be real for us, there had to be a death. And there had to be a, re- there had to be a burial. And then you and I come to the good part. The part that we celebrate. You and I have to celebrate the power of the empty tomb. In John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, you and I simply read the story or the account, not a story, the account of 
the, the earliest disciples finding the tomb empty. And our text realize, reveals for us that three individuals in particular came to the tomb that day. Y'all remember who they are, obviously. Mary in verse 1 came, and she was, came early in the morning while it was yet dark, and she was so committed to the Lord that she had come to perform um, um, some kind of a sacrificial rite at the tomb. Now remember, the other gospel writers tell us that when Jesus' body was placed in the tomb, that this tomb was sealed and Roman guards were placed over the tomb just to make sure that those disciples don't come steal his body away and then say, hey, look, he's risen from the dead, okay? And so Mary comes early in the tomb. John makes no reference to the finding of the soldiers. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not there. Just John's, It's not John's purpose to tell us that. And it's not John's purpose to tell us how the stone was moved. But by the time Mary gets there, the stone is already removed. And y'all have heard preacher cliches, and you've heard preachers say, listen, the tomb wasn't moved so that, they could get, so that Jesus could get out. It was moved so that they could get in and see that it was empty. And so Mary comes, and she finds the tomb empty. Following along behind, after she finds it, she runs and tells the disciples, the disciple that Jesus loved is probably the gospel writer John. John and Peter take off toward the, toward the tomb. John, being younger than Peter, outruns him and gets there and stops and looks in. Now, i got to be honest with you. That's probably what I'd do. I probably wouldn't rush right into a fresh tomb, would you? Oh, well, well, maybe you've be- you're got more constitution than me. Hey, listen, when I was in law enforcement, you know where I worked at night? You know where I took my evening naps? In the cemetery. You know why? Ain't nobody going to bother you over there. If somebody taps on the window in the middle of the night, I'm, I'm gone, man. I, I'm gone. Because ain't nobody going to bother you in the cemetery. Got there and stopped. Peter, as you and I always, whenever we read about Peter, we always kind of think we're like him. Everybody thinks they're like Peter because he's impulsive. He, he's just headstrong, and he gets there, and instead of stopping and peeping in to see what's in there, he rushes right on in, and, and the script, notice what John tells us specifically. They find the linen cloths still laying there. However, just, just like they would have been, but the, the napkin that covers the face is rolled up and laid on the side. Now, y'all know the significance of that is this wasn't just wiggling out of the wrappings, yawning and stretching and leaving. This means Jesus was in no hurry. To, he just got up took time to fold that thing and lay it to the side. You know why? He's confident. He's victorious. He no longer has anything left to fear. They rush right in. But, you know, there's somebody else present here. There are angels. When Mary, after they, after they process that and Mary goes back, she goes in. Did Peter and John not see the angels in there? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We don't know. But what we know is Mary did, and they're the ones who said to him, why, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And then Jesus himself appears. And I've got to get this in my mind. Because we always have this mental image, I think, of Mary standing outside the tomb and talking to the angels, and then Jesus kind of comes creeping down the path and speaks to her. That's really not what the text says. What the text says, she goes into the tomb, and the two angels are sitting there, one at the head, one at the feet. They talk to her and tell her he's risen from the dead, and then Jesus appears. Y'all know what that means? That means Jesus came back to the tomb. You know why? He's no longer scared of it. He's no longer afraid of it. He's already been victorious over that tomb, and he is no longer fearful of the tomb or death itself. I think that's significant. Friends, it means whatever tomb you feel like you're in, Jesus is in there with you. He'll come and he'll be with you in whatever you're experiencing. And uh, w- without, without just dragging you on through a long sermon, I'm going to jump down to verse 17 because Jesus says that he's going to ascend to the Father. Now, why is that important? Because if Jesus goes, he's going to come back again. You remember the promise that Jesus made in John chapter 14? Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, listen to this. 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you can be also. And then Thomas, one of the disciples, spoke for all the rest of us when he said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And then Jesus uttered those famous words. Y'all remember what they are, don't you? I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In other words, we have to recognize a death. There are two deaths you and I have to recognize. His and ours. You and I have to die to self in order to experience the power of the resurrection. My arrogant, opinionated self has to die. Not my body, but my soul and my spirit, my consciousness, that rational thinking part of me, I have to be willing to say, Lord, just like Paul, I consider it all rubbish in favor of knowing the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. I have to be willing to die to self so that, and then if I die to self, what's going to happen to me? I have to be buried. Listen, you can't, you can't say, I'm going to follow Jesus and, and I'm going to sacrifice some, but I'm not willing to be buried. Because what that implies is you're not giving it all. You have to be willing to, you have to, be willing to die and almost be buried. That's, that's why baptism is important, gang, because baptism is symbolic that not only has Mike died to, to himself, he's, not only is he willing to sacrifice his own self and, Lord, I'm, for you, I'm, I'm giving you everything, Mike has to be willing to be buried. Now, the good news for us, it's symbolic. We're buried in the water and we're raised, <laughs> I say it every time, to walk in the newness of life because we have new resurrection power. Listen, you and I have to recognize, in order to truly celebrate the resurrection, you can call it Easter if you want to, but what we're celebrating is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Recognize that he died, that he was buried, the finality of it, and then you can truly celebrate that he is risen from the dead. You know, there's a hymn that we used to sing that said, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. I was there when he rose up from the grave. How in the world can I say that I was there? Because I have trusted him as Savior and Lord. And in doing so, it was my sin in him nailed to the cross. I was there. It was my sin that he carried into the grave and buried it there. And it was my salvation that he gave when he walked up out of that tomb. And friends, what he's done for me, he will do for you. I'm going to finish with this. Jesus stood at the, friend, at the graveside of his friend Lazarus one day and had a conversation with the sister. She was mad because she said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, you know, he that believeth in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And then he asked this question, do you believe this? Do you? Do you really believe that Jesus is risen from the dead? Not theoretically, not in a religious sense, 
Do you personally believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that he paid for your sin on the cross, and you've asked his forgiveness? Lord, I'll die to myself so that you may live in me. Have you done that? No greater way to celebrate the resurrection than to give your heart to Jesus Christ. You can do it right here now, today. Simple prayer. Lord, please forgive me of my sin. I admit it. I acknowledge it. And I ask you to forgive me. Would you be born in me? Would you? We call it forgive me. Lord, would you be born in me? Help me to be born spiritually to a life that is eternal in you. Now, I'm going to be as honest as I know how to be because i got nothing else to do. I know that in a congregation this size, odds are, ain't, this ain't good language, it ain't nobody going to come down here in a congregation this size because you all got places to be. But I'm going to tell you, don't bank on tomorrow. You may not make it to tomorrow. Yesterday, we had the memorial service for a good Wonderful friend of our church, David Connell. He was here two Sundays ago, sat in his spot right there. The next day, he was gone. Friends, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to point out the reality of life and death. Trust Jesus Christ today. And you come here. I'll be here to pray with you. If you want to come and let us pray with you, Jeff will be on one side, Mike will be on the other side. We'll pray with you. But in the pew in front of you, there's an information card. If today you would trust Jesus Christ and you'd like for me to know that so that I can pray for you, so we can give you some stuff that will help you in your walk with Jesus Christ, take one of those cards, fill it out, fold it, and leave it on the pew. Scan. <laughs> now we're back to step one. Scan it with your smart device. Fill it out. Tell us so that we can help you know that it's real and that it's true. We give you some resources to help you in your new life with Jesus Christ. That sound good to you all?